welcome back to Vinyl Friday where I go through my records in alphabetical order like a big nerd and talk about why I love them. It's our third week of the Vinyl Friday Revolver Odyssey, which means that we will be listening to this track. <sighs> track three, side one, I'm only sleeping. We're gonna do things a little bit differently around here today because I have a question that I would like answered. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna lay out the arguments and then while you're thinking about your answer, I'm gonna talk about music a little bit, specifically what it is that they are doing musically to make the song sound sleepy. And then we'll wrap up and ideally you will tell me what you think the answer is. Are we following? Good, okay, here's the question. Is I'm Only Sleeping an existential lament about the crushing weight of being alive, or is it literally just a song about the merits of a good nap? Let's begin. One, existential woe. Let's paint a picture. You're John Lennon. It's 1966. For the past three years, you have kept up relentless touring. <laughs> conferences. How did how did the Ringo come about? Because I wear four rings. Fair enough, yes. Quick, I'm not called Ringo. No, I can see that. I hope the camera can. It's called Hamdo. Gig after gig after gig before an audience of people screaming their lungs out at you. <laughs> Shut so... up, Ali's talking! Yeah. <laughs> You've been expected to put out two albums a year and you have delivered and you have filmed and released and done the press circuit for two films. It's been a hard That's not even counting before that, where you were slogging it because you were trying to make it as a musician in Liverpool and around the north of England. <laughs> or even before that, in Hamburg, where you're playing five to eight hours a night. The longest regular gig that I've ever played was four hours every Friday. And that took quite a lot out of me. Granted, I was not drugged up to my eyeballs on Brilliant. Maybe that was my failing. <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute also to explain why it is that touring is so tiring, because you'd think it's just being on planes and then sitting in hotels and then playing gigs and there's heaps of downtime. But the thing is that the transport itself is quite tiring, spending hours on planes, the jet lag, airports, the, if you've ever been on a plane, you know what really takes it out of you. Then you have interviews to do, you have press to deal with, you have to be on, you have to be in like charismatic mode, funny and charming, that's tiring. And then if you have any downtime, it's not in your own home, you're not surrounded by your things, you're in another hotel room. When you go to bed that night, you're not sleeping in your own bed, you're sleeping in a hotel bed. And that's not even even getting to the gig. Gigs are really tiring. You were just laying yourself bare for an enormous audience. <laughs> These guys were playing to enormous crowds. We weren't playing to crowds quite that big. But the the adrenaline of it, the being on stage, the performing, the again having to summon the energy to be really charismatic and engaging and fun to watch. And then just the offense of roaring, the sheer amount of noise. <laughs> All of that is draining. When my band went on tour for our first album, I really thought it was gonna be like a holiday with my two best friends. We were gonna go on a road trip, we were gonna get to play music, but a lot of the interviews that we had to do were really early in the morning. And then you've got a solid block of several hours, but you can't really go anywhere too far or do anything that's gonna to be too energy sapping. You've gotta do your pack and your sound check, then the gig itself, and then you go to sleep in a hotel room. There's a lot about touring that, that takes it out of you. Touring was a drag, madness from morning till night with not one moment's peace. Living with each other in a room for four years on tour. We toured like for four years. Of course, there were great moments. Whenever we talk about it, it's all laughs. Half the time we just mime on the mic because your voice had gone and anything like that. The kids would just be howling. More broadly, in the Western world, the UK has a general election. It has just been announced in the States that the number of troops being sent to Vietnam is going to be substantially increased. In response to that, there has been an increased number of public demonstrations against the war. The civil rights movement is well underway. Martin Luther King himself is speaking out publicly against the Vietnam War. We've had our first controlled moon landing. And critically, the FIFA World Cup trophy was stolen. Fortunately, it was recovered by a dog named Pickles. <laughs> Good boy, Pickles. And of course, 
On March 4th, there is an interview that Maureen Cleave has done with John Lennon that is published in which he says that the Beatles are more popular than Jesus, and I'm sure that that won't come back to bite him in the ass. Hurricanes hitting, race riots, students on riots. fire. There was always something that we pulled into town. There was always some big thing going on, and we'd come in the middle with this mania, and that it'd just be like, Chaos. Basically, early 1966 John Lennon is tired. I think it is telling that right after the release of this album, and at the conclusion of a truly horrific tour in which they were chased out of the Philippines. Did you get kicked in? No, I was very delicate and moved every time they touched me. <laughs> and they received death threats in the States. We have ways and means to stop this if uh, this is going to be the case, yeah. Because it turns out that interview didn't really pan out so well for John Lennon. People were burning their records. In an interview, Ringo said that when they were playing their final gigs in the States, he was playing with his cymbals tilted up a little bit because he was worried about being shot. Fortunately, he was not shot. Unfortunately, another Beatle was later shot in the States. Now I've bummed myself out. So yeah, I think it's telling that they release this album, they go on their tour, and they go, that's, that's it, I'm done. That's enough. John Lennon has said of the song, Help, that as he was writing it, he didn't realize that it was like a subconscious cry for help. And he released it and went, ah, I guess I did need help. <laughs> so maybe this song is a similar case where he thinks he's just writing a song about being tired, but maybe this was his subconscious telling him, you're too tired, you're doing too much, slow down. And you know, if your subconscious tells you that, it's probably a good idea to listen. I suppose in this case, I did. I first encountered this album when I was about six years old. It was copied for me onto a cassette tape by a family friend. Shout out Gail and Tom, you changed my life. I really loved this one. I thought the backing vocals were just stunning. We'll get into that. I'm very, very fond of this song. And I was especially fond of it as a six-year-old, I think because the subject matter was really relatable. <laughs> I also enjoyed sleeping as a six-year-old. As an adult, with Bills, who is subject to the relentless onslaught of information by way of the World Wide Web, I also find this song incredibly relatable, but for totally different reasons than I did when I was six. I feel that this song does speak to the exhaustion of being an adult human being with responsibilities in a world that feels like it's going crazy. Let's examine some lyrical evidence. There are a couple of lines in particular in this song that feel very evasive, very escapist. It's like the 1966 equivalent of, I'm taking a social media break at the moment. I'll show you what I mean. Stay in bed, float upstream. You're sort of disappearing into your own mindscape, leaving everything else behind. Don't wake me, just leave me alone. I don't need to engage with everything. It is exhausting. There's also a lot about this song that in that vein feels like he is deliberately divorcing himself from the rat race and from all of the other people running around. Observe. Please. I don't mind. I think crazy. Running everywhere at such a speed. I don't mind. I think they're crazy running everywhere at such a speed. So he has separated himself from the furor of society, of all of the wild events that are taking place. Maybe he's just taking a moment and giving himself a, a little breathing room. In that sense, I think that there is also kind of a philosophical bent to this song. A la Tomorrow Never Knows. There are a lot of similarities, I think, with that song, specifically in the references to floating upstream. In this case, he is floating upstream. Float upstream. As opposed to in Tomorrow Never Knows, where he is floating downstream. Float downstream. Which begs the question, how do you float upstream? That would be swimming. Let's not read too much into it. Now, I find that especially in this line here. Till they find there's no need. There's this real sense of all of it is a construct, all of it is an illusion. You can separate yourself from it, nothing is real. <laughs> I think that theme seems to show up in a lot of John Lennon's lyrics. Don't get too attached to things because none of it is real. We're living in a simulation! John Lennon, 1966.
And again, I really relate to that as an adult person living in 2024 because there is so much going on. There has been so much going on of late. We have so much access to all of the information about all of those goings on. Without becoming too down, everything is really expensive. We're having to work harder. And a lot of the safety nets that were designed to protect us from falling through the cracks are sort of being slowly eroded. There's nothing to catch a lot of us if we fall. Now, I know that that's quite heavy, but when I listen to that song as an adult, that's kind of what I hear. And there is something very seductive about the idea of just taking a minute, lying there and staring at the ceiling, falling into a sleepy, meditative state, going with the flow. And in a sense, I do think that there is some merit to doing that sometimes for the sake of your mental health. We can't carry everything that's happening all the time. It's a lot. <laughs> so there we have it. That's argument one. This song is about the existential burden that we all carry as part of the human condition. Argument one. Argument two. The song is about sleeping. I think it is a well-established fact that John Lennon was a slothful man. Is that a word? Let's check. Good. That is a word. I remember reading a story in Mark Lewison's Tune In, and I cannot find it on the internet, so if anybody has a copy of that book and can back it up, please post it in the comments. I may even pin it, if I can remember it correctly. John Lennon, as a young man in Liverpool, got a job as a luggage handler at Liverpool Airport because Aunt Mimi decided if you cannot follow the straight and narrow in an academic context then you need to go out and get yourself a job. He lasted I think a matter of days. He decided that it was not for him. It was very tedious and very tiring and too much commute time. Boy I wish we all had the privilege to just go eh, forget the nine to five. I'm gonna become a rock musician and for that to actually work out. No of course I'm not talking about me. <laughs> Ironically Assuming I have the story correct, they named that airport after him. <laughs> I'd like to think that he would find that funny now. They probably did it while he was alive, who knows? I could, but I don't want to look it up right now. The man loved to sleep, which is fair because sleep is delightful. Maureen Cleave wrote in that interview that I referenced earlier, he can sleep almost indefinitely, is probably the laziest person in England. John Lennon says, I quote, physically lazy. I don't mind writing or reading or watching or speaking, but sex is the only physical thing I can be bothered with anymore. So when he's not at work as a beetle, he's lying down. He's sleeping. And again, as somebody who loves a good nap, there's also a solid argument. <laughs> I think as Beatles fans, we can sometimes have a tendency to read too much into Beatles lyrics. So maybe they just needed material and he was just phoning it in and writing a song about how nice sleep is. And if this is what it looks like when John Lennon is phoning it in, I'll take it. As stated earlier, I love this song. Right. While you meditate on those two arguments, let's talk about some music. One of the most brilliant things about this seemingly very simple song is that it feels sleepy, very lethargic and dopey. And here are some of the ways that I think they achieved that. The first is that the beat is almost very slightly late. That's not to say that Ringo is not playing in time, but rather that in music, you can play right on the beat or you can play just behind it. It takes a lot of skill and control to do that well, because if you leave it too long, then it sounds like you're playing out of time. But there's this sweet spot that you can find where it sounds just right, where it's got a little groove to it. I'll see if I can find an example on the vocals. Just a moment. Please don't leave me. No, don't shake me. Leave me where I am. It's slow, it's sluggish, it's kind of lazy. He's slurring the way he's speaking as well. When I wake up early in the morning, it sounds like he's just woken up early in the morning. And apparently he never woke up early in the morning. Apparently he was very good at sleeping in and Paul used to have to wake him up, which is right on brand. <laughs> We've got our sleepy sound effects. Apparently just before that you can hear John say, yawn Paul, but I haven't been able to hear it. The song has this heavy plodding bass. We've sort of covered how Jeff Emmerich achieved the like heavy bass sound and that is by very illegally at Abbey Road Studios in 1966 putting a microphone right up against the bass amplifier. Big no no, big yes yes. <laughs> it's got this almost muffled tone to it. 
slangerous. I was thinking about this this morning, it's really difficult to describe. The tone sounds round as opposed to sharp. I don't know if that means anything to you, but I think that's the perfect definition. <laughs> and then there's the bass line itself, which sounds like it's dragging its feet. Let's get the bass correspondent in to demonstrate. Now I can't move on from the bass in this song without mentioning this beautiful riff that was featured in my top 50 Paul McCartney bass lines video. Check out this glorious thing. <laughs> An earlier take had vibraphone as one of the lead instruments, which I think is a pretty sleepy instrument. That take sounded a little bit like this. I quite like the lineup that they did decide to go with, but in case you're curious, here's what it would have sounded like if they had gone with that sort of vibraphone sound. I'm pretty sleepy. And perhaps most importantly, we've got this very dreamy, surrealistic, reversed guitar solo. What's really cool about this solo is that George Harrison wrote it backwards so that it would sound good when you played it forwards and the guitar was reversed. I hope that makes sense. What I mean is, if this is the chord sequence, for this section of the song. Here's what that chord sequence sounds like in reverse. George Harrison wrote a solo to that second chord sequence so that when he recorded it against that chord sequence, they could flip it and it wouldn't sound like he was playing over the wrong chords. Here's what the solo sounded like before it was reversed. This was a revolutionary choice because as far as I'm aware it was the first time that this technological choice was used in popular music. Of course they also used it on Rain. influential. You can hear a lot of their contemporaries doing this after this album was released, like Crosby, Stills and Nash did it on Pre-Road Downs from their 1969 eponymous debut, which we have covered on this channel gleefully. Now, I think it's really cool the way that George Harrison did this, and I think that the solo works really beautifully, but true to form, Jeff Emmerich had some not so charitable things to say about it. Let's go to our storytime correspondent who will tell us more. Hi there, we're coming to you from outside today because the weather is nice and <laughs> the uh, film space is currently being used for a very boring corporate work meeting. Boo! Which I suppose is exactly the kind of thing that John Lennon would rather be asleep for. We'll be taking today's reading from Here, There and Everywhere, My Life Recording the Music of the Beatles by Jeff Emmerich. This one's a doozy. Some days of course were better than others. There was one especially tedious session where we all wished we had never come up with the concept of backward sounds. The song was I'm Only Sleeping and George Harrison was determined to play a backwards guitar solo on it. At the best of times, he had trouble playing solos all the way through forwards. So it was with great trepidation that we all settled in for what turned out to be an interminable day of listening to the same eight bars played backwards over and over again. The shade. Genuinely, what did that man have against George Harrison? I think it's interesting that it sounds a little bit like the Taxman solo, even though the Taxman solo is played forwards and this is played backwards. It's also similar in that the Taxman solo closes out the song, like this. Compare that against this. Love that. Out of interest, here's what that sounds like played forwards. We've got 
our beautiful, soothing, calming vocals, which for me make the whole song, specifically this one. <laughs> I love that. And while we're on the subject of harmonies, who could forget? All the world going by my window. Oh, good work, Paul. Good work. The last thing that I would say about the music in this song is that it feels like it ends in an unresolved place. To be clear, I don't mean it's musically unresolved because it does return to the root. It's soothing and it's calming and reassuring, but it ends here. <laughs> That doesn't sound like the way that you would end a peaceful meditation on the bliss of sleeping. Which leads me to think that maybe this song is about something heavier, but again, I'll leave that to you to decide. I'm not going to step all over your decision-making process. Before we close out the episode, there's one last thing that I would like to mention, and that is that the music video for the song won a Grammy last month. <laughs> the video is by an artist named M. Cooper, who painted over 1,300 oil paintings to put together the music video. The film is made up of individual oil paintings. I'm literally painting a frame, I take a shot, and then I usually just wipe it and repaint and the next frame and the next frame and the next frame. It's really old school, it's just frame by frame. And here's a little bit of what the video itself looks like. <laughs> Truly it is a beautiful piece of work and it, it covers so many different periods of John Lennon's life. I worked really closely with the archivist from Apple Corps who really helped me find the, the right pieces of archive footage of the Beatles. Interestingly to me, this M. Cooper artist person also seems to be of a mind that the song is about something heavier than just sleep. It feels kind of like a defiant position against the kind of capitalist view of time. You know, we must get everything done. It's almost like Lennon saying like, you know, I'm not hurting anyone by sleeping. Preach, Em. That's it for me. If you enjoyed this episode and or you would like to support any of the weird things that I do, I'll leave a link in the description to my Buy Me A Coffee page where you are welcome to make a donation if you wish, but no obligation, no pressure, friends. Thanks for hanging out with me. I will see you here next week. Have a great weekend. What's your favorite song? Uh, like Christmas. Yeah, and, and uh, God Rule the Wenseless Kingdom. I like this another one of my favorites. Did you say White Christmas? Yeah. yeah. It's a good song. Not in rock Especially and roll. Christmas. Oh, yeah, Sorry, it is, yeah. Like yeah, it is. You've heard it. Oh. I'm <laughs> dreaming of life. God bless you, Mom. Thank you, Dad. <laughs>